You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Hello, Saver. Whether you're saving for that trip to the tropics or saving for an emergency, now is the time to take advantage of Wells Fargo's savings options. Wells Fargo offers savings accounts that can help you save towards your goals. So what are you saving for? Visit a Wells Fargo branch or wellsfargo.com slash save to open a savings account today. Wells Fargo Bank, N.A., member FDIC. Hi, everybody, and welcome to Who Did What Now, the history podcast that's not your history class. With me, your host, Katie Charlwood, history harlot and reader of books. Sad news today, everybody. Sad news. Well, many news. First news, sad. I didn't make it to the shortlist of the Irish Podcast Awards, which is fine because it's all like The Sun and The BBC and News Talk. So, yeah, um, kind of not really that fussed about it considering it's all these short form, like highly media production situation. So, like, whatever, it's fine. And Medium News uh, still up for the Listener's Choice Awards. So the link is in the description down below if you'd like to vote. That'd be absolutely amazing. And uh, and good news, of course, because, you know, you have to have a sprinkling of good news, is that my very first Dublin show is next month. Now, I haven't got all the details ironed out yet, but once I know, you will know. So I, I actually want to thank everybody for the reviews as well. I've had, like, at least one review a day, like, the past, like, 20 days. Like, it's amazing. And you all say such lovely things. Like, it's, it's, like, ridiculously kind. And it's, things have been up and down, you know, the past couple weeks. So it's really been quite nice to hear lovely things. So thank you. And on top of that, I went to the Murder Most Irish live show last week because we support each other. That's how it works in this business and um, the podcasting world. And like the person who was supposed to come with me couldn't make it for health reasons. And so I knew my pal Ethan was in the country from Denmark. At least I was fairly sure he was back in the country from Denmark. And I was like, hey, buddy. Uh, you in Dublin? <laughs> you want to go to a live podcast with me? <laughs> and um, I failed to mention to him that it was a feminist murder <laughs> a crime podcast. So literally he sits down and one of the first things he hears is, fuck men, castrate men. And it's like, oh, oh no. And he's like, I'm just going to drink my pint. Nobody will know I'm here. It's fine. <laughs> they can smell the cess hit. They're going to come for me. It was so funny. It was so funny. Poor Ethan. <laughs> he was just, I I did not prepare him for what, what he was going into. And he was like, I didn't even ask what I was going to. And I was like, oh no, you did. I just forgot to mention because I got lost for the first time, <laughs> like in Dublin, because normally I'm pretty good at like figuring out where I am but like it was raining and I hadn't eaten all day and I was just not not with it so he ended up uh having to find me and then show me where we were supposed to go even though I had the route planned like I had it all figured out but then nope completely buggered it up absolutely and um like we're we're heading to the sugar club we're heading down from temple bar and we're just like how do I put this? Well, we're going very fast. It's a very brisk pace. We're practically running. And well, I'm practically running because I have to keep up with Ethan's big massive strides because he's six foot seven. And obviously I'm like, you know, like <laughs> like one of those small dogs just like trying to keep up with my legs. And we're just like going very fast. And he's like, do we, do we need to rush? And I was like, no. And he's like, why are we both going so fast? I was like, I don't know. We're both from Donegal. Like, going at a gentle pace is just how things are. Why are we like this? And he's like, yeah, but everything's so far away. 
we're going we have to get there as quickly as possible and I'm like oh yeah I get it now but yeah it was a good night we had a great time I had a couple of Aperol spritzes actually they were very nice and um, <laughs> then we went to McDonald's and ate an obscene amount of chicken nuggets nuggies I love nuggies though oh yum but anyway I know what you're thinking you're thinking what your jibber jabber in fact me in fact you I will but first we've got to get our source on our sources are 1666 plague war and hellfire by Rebecca Redeal London a social history by Roy Porter the diary of Samuel Peppers by Samuel Pepys. By Permission of Heaven, The Story of the Great Fire of London by Adrian Tinniswood. The Dreadful Judgment, The True Story of the Great Fire of London by Neil Hansen. And of course we have The London Gazette and History.com. Now are you sitting comfortably? Good. Then let's begin. The Great Fire of London. Now, this is something I've actually been really excited to talk about because, you know, the whole point of creating this podcast was to talk about people and places and events and stuff that I found interesting. And also, you know, utilise my skills because I've said it before and I'll say it again. My main area of expertise is the rise of sensationalism and the use of print as propaganda in the late modern period. That is a mouthful, I know. So, like, I try and deal with when I can, information that is withheld or covered up or misleading and try to find the truth in it, you know. And that's usually where I'm at. And this is one of those things because this is one of those events that like, if you're in school in Britain especially, you just know. And everything happens in 66s, you know. English history is full of 66s, like Battle of Hastings, 1066, Great Fire of London, 1666, England wins the World Cup, 1966. (laughs) English history, 101, you're welcome. But something I've noticed a lot about the way that we study events especially is that we separate ourselves from it and it's seen as a thing wait that's not right like you you compartmentalize like you you separate it so it's just a thing that happened historical events they tend to be separated um and exist as if they're fantasy like it's a story as opposed to something real something very real that happened Two people. Like, it's as if we take the personhood out of it and we don't really discuss lives, livelihoods, people affected during and by and after. Like, we we separate that as if people were not involved in it. There's this disconnect when it comes to events. And I've always wanted to touch on things like this, especially large historical events, Especially something like this, because there's a lot of human error in here and it's very interesting. Because what leads to it and what comes after it. And because of the way we are taught about events, we perceive them in a way that's just so separate to us. And I think it's important to reconnect and try and observe it from a different point of view. So I better get into it. Yeah, I better get into it. now. <laughs> Stop rambling, cutie, and tell us the history. Fact us. Okay, I'm on it, I promise. So, leading up to the Great Fire of London, so King Charles II, the Merry Monarch, King Charles II, uh, he is on the throne. And he is, he's okay. I mean, he's not the most popular. But he is, he's the King of England. And the reason he's the King of England is because his father, King Charles I, is no longer the King of England. Uh, Generally, in order for the crown to pass on from one to another, one of two things has to happen. Um, You either abdicate your position, you abdicate the throne, you give it up, you give up your title, 
are your claim. The other is death. And uh, King Charles I, uh, well, how do I put this? Uh, he was kind of a tyrant. I mean, kind of. He was a tyrant who believed in the divine right of kings. He thought he was God's representative on earth. He felt like everybody should be bowing down before him and that he should be answering to no one. And so he pissed a lot of fucking people off, which led to a civil war, some hilarious disguises, and, you know, King Charles being deposed and his head being cut off. So, you know, not great all round. So because he was so power hungry, when the Puritans and the Cromwell, because it's always a fucking Cromwell, and the Puritans had been in charge for a while um, and buggered things up royally, excuse the pun, Britain decided to, you know, reinstate the monarchy and put King Charles II on the throne. So King Charles II, he's known as the Merry Monarch. He's always shagging about. He's putting money into the arts and he's funding a lot of stuff. And he's doing, he's doing, you know, he's doing all right. I mean, Parliament isn't super into him and he doesn't have as much power and yeah, it's a it's a whole situation. So because they don't want him to have too much power, because you know the whole thing of his father being tyrannical, and it's yeah, it's it's there's there's some stuff going on. And by sixteen sixty six, he's been on the throne for what six years at this point, and he's been trying to make changes to well, London, especially because that's where he's living at this point. And he's trying to implement sort of rules and laws and they keep getting fucking vetoed because they're just pissed off that he's trying to do shit, right? And yeah, there's a wee bit of xenophobia in there as if, like, the majority of British monarchs have not been foreign. But anyway, London in 1666 isn't doing too great. You know, England's at war with the Dutch and the French... They've been dealing with the plague for a fucking year. That's right, the plague is back. And people are basically living on top of each other. So, and like London is a very young city, not an age. Like it's fucking old, it's Londonium, it's it's well old. But there's a lot of younger people living in London and there's also a lot of sort of migration. So there's immigration and migration. So people are coming in and out. People from England, Scotland, Wales, whatever. And also from other countries, so Belgium, France, the Netherlands, from everywhere, you know. Because London, with the Thames and everything, is also a trade city. And it has been since, well, since the Romans were there. And it's very old. In so many ways, like the way that London is built at this time is it's still very much in line with a medieval city. It's practically medieval. So yeah, the way the houses are built and lined up, it's like, I don't know if you've ever played any of the Fable games, but it's like playing the Fable games. Like that's what London looked like. Near enough, everything was made of wood. It was a tinderbox, basically. Houses were built very close together, if not practically attached, and they would have these jetties. So there would be, like, the base of the house, like the lower floor, the ground floor. And then the floor above that would have these little extensions, really. It's like having... Like, the Weasley's house in Harry Potter is, is one of the things I can, like, think of it. Imagine you've got a square block and then you set a rectangle on top of it sideways. Like that. So you've got a little bit protruding either side. So you've got this little platform and you're going out just a little bit, but that's like the top floor. So you'll have these protruding sort of top floors that would lead basically into each other. You know, they were technically separate, but they were so close. Like, physically close and all of these buildings are made of wood and some still had thatched roofs which was illegal at this point um king charles ii he'd actually tried to like ban jetties 
but they still existed. Like, he's like, this isn't safe. Can we get rid of these? And uh, effectively, everyone went, no. No, thank you. Yeah, not many of the houses were thatched. There still was a couple because, yeah, it just was. And so you've got houses and shops and stables and other buildings of bakeries and shit. You know, you've got all this all tightly packed together on these like higgledy-piggledy narrow streets. And most buildings were, you know, multi-purpose. So you could live in there, but also work in there, but also use it for storage. So people would be storing everything from like straw and hay and pitch and tallow and coal, tar, canvas, spirits, rope, hemp, resin and oil. Now take this, all of these incredibly flammable items. So so much of a fire hazard and add that with uh, the fact that quite a lot of businesses uh, relied on open flames so everything from food to metalwork and other such things like there, there's just a lot of burning going on there's just a lot of fire now this may shock you gentle listener but London had quite a habit of going on fire. Fires were pretty common, actually. So most streets, they would have like these leather buckets that were supposed to be filled with water to help put the fires out. And they also had like hooks to bring down buildings. Now, you ever see those cartoons where it was like a bunch of firemen in a row and they're just passing buckets up with water? Basically that. It was very much a medieval sort of idea, but it was still here in the 17th century. But yes, London is a relatively young city. And by that, I mean it is full of a lot of young people. So people would come from the countryside or wherever they were coming from. They would learn their trades. They would get skilled up, their apprenticeships and whatnot, and then move back out to areas, sort of, and have more options. Like some would stay, obviously, not everybody did, but a lot of people would just go back to their original areas once they had learned their skill. And then some people would go out and become like merchant seamen and sailors, navy, all that kind of stuff. But London itself was really fucking busy because it was like a trading port. And so you'd have like imports and exports. Like England exported quite a lot actually. So there was like leather and tin, and lead, and wool, and cheese. Cheese was very important. And you're thinking, English cheese? Really? No, no, yes. Cheese was just a big deal. Which will come to play later on, and maybe the only thing that some people know about the Great Fire of London. And at this point, London had a population of about 460,000 people, like give or take. And that's actually mad when you think about it because about 60 years previously, it only had about 200,000. So it's more than doubled, which is even wilder when you take into consideration that between 1665 and 1666, like 100,000 people died as a result of the Black Death of the Plague. London still managed to have Nearly 500,000 people, when you think about it, nearly half a million people lived in this city. Even though, for the last year, two out of every seven people died as a result of the Black Death. That's fucking wild. Like, it's it just shows you just, like, how much was coming in and out. And London, like, physically is a bit weird. I know I already explained, like, the tightly packed houses and whatnot. And this was mainly, I mean, it was all over, but it was mainly inside sort of old London. So the city of London, because there's three parts effectively to London. So you've got the city of London, which is like the old Roman wall. So you've got that, which still to this day holds it in like a different regard because London City 
and the city of London are two different fucking things, um, which I wasn't really aware of until I started researching uh, Jack the Ripper stuff, to be honest. And that was when I learned about, like, yeah, there's, like the Met is one police force, and then the city of London has a different police force. It's, it's wild, like, the, 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 yeah. Anyhow, so we'll talk about that another time. That'll be another conversation. But yeah, there are three areas to London. You've got, like, again, the old London, the Roman walled London, the city of London, that's that. And then you've got the area around this. And then you've got the city of Westminster. You know, it's... And unsurprisingly, the further you get from, like, the densely populated part of the city, the the wealthier people seem to be. You know, down by the Strand and whatnot. Like, there's just a little bit, of, a little bit more money flying about. And speaking about wealth, right, a lot of people who lived in London didn't own the properties they lived in. They, they rented them. People would lodge in boarding houses, inns, taverns, and, of course, houses. Which, again, can to become relevant later on. And London, yeah, London is this dense, bustling city. You've got this high population density, you've got people living very close together, and you've just had one of the hottest summers on record. Like, it's it's just been so dry. And there is an easterly breeze this warm September evening in this wooden city. And it is like the perfect storm for this to happen, but it's affected by, well, people. So it is the 2nd of September, 1666, and on Pudding Lane in London. It's the early hours of the morning, it's a Sunday. And the thing about Sundays is Sunday was your rest day. It was the day where, you know, you went to church, you saw friends, you had the day off, it was your day of rest. It's the Sabbath, people would have been working and trading, like, all through the week, all the way through. And so, Thomas Farriner, he has a bakery on Pudding Lane, which is called Pudding Lane, because it was named after awful puddings, so basically, like, entrails and stuff that would fall off of butchers' carts as they were taken to the Thames. Because everything it dumped in the Thames. So, uh, fecal matter, urine, the, the just entrails, goo, just all your waste. All your waste ended up in the river, which people would then use for bathing and drinking. But that's another story for another day. Okay. But yes, there's the bakery, the foreigner's bakery, and... And Thomas is living there with his wife and his children and their maid, right? And they're, they've got the bakery and he goes to bed and his wife has this nagging feeling and she's like, did you check the fire? Did you make sure the fire was out? And he's like, yeah, it's definitely out. It's definitely out. Now, this may come as a shock to you, uh, but the fire was not out. It had not been quelled. So around about one or two o'clock in the morning... Something happens, a spark comes out, something wasn't closed up, and the fire begins to spread. And unfortunately for Thomas Farriner, his bakery is on fire. Now, luckily for the whole Farriner family, an apprentice who was coming in to start his day, he was coming like in the really early hours of the morning, he shows up, sees the fire, and just alerts the family. He is shouting at them, you know, place is on fire, get the fuck out. Now, I'm not suggesting that was verbatim. I'm just saying that's the general gist of it. So the apprentice wakes up the foreigner family and Thomas and his wife and the children, they escape through an upstairs window. The maid, however, is the first person to perish as a result of the fire. She was too afraid to to leap out the window, to climb out. And so she stayed inside the bakery and 
I don't know whether the smoke got to her first or whether she was engulfed in the flames, but she did not make it out. And it doesn't take long for the fire to spread. So these buildings, remember, they're very close together. You've got the jetties. You know, flames are licking the sides of these houses before consuming them. So sparks are going and there's this strong wind from the east which just starts billowing the flames down Fish Street Hill and it's going towards the Thames. And so this fire is raging. It is burning through the streets and people are shit scared. They're panicking and it's the early hours of the morning. It's night time. These people have been working all week. So no one is in the right mind when they are woken up suddenly. Like they're just not. Uh, like a little bit of sleep deprivation is gonna be is gonna be playing a part here because I know we talk about fight or flight all the time, but this is extreme for a lot of people. And so they're doing what they're supposed to do. They're filling up their buckets and they're trying to like douse the flames, but they've got a wind that's fighting against them. And so the next option they have is to pull down the buildings, which is the best way to like create a fire break. They want to pull down these buildings. And so people go to the Lord Mayor, Thomas Bloodworth, and they're going to him because they need his permission to pull these fucking buildings down. And so they go off to see him. They wake him up. He's like, Pfft, the fire's not that bad. Because, like, London, again, used to fires. And he's like, it's fine. It's all the way over there. And, like, no, it's bad. We need to pull down these buildings. And instead of, you know, doing the right thing, he tells them that if they pull down the buildings, they're going to have to pay for them. Because they're tenants. They don't own the buildings. So that's up to you. You're going to have this expense. Buildings that are going to be consumed by fire. And he's like, but if you pull them down first, you're liable. And he's convinced the fire ain't that bad anyway. Like, they're asking him what to do. And he's, he basically says, a woman will piss it out. Now, I don't know about you, but that really doesn't instill a level of confidence. And the official who's supposed to be the man in charge of the safety and well-being of London and its inhabitants. Being a part of a royal family might seem enticing, but more often than not, it comes at the expense of everything else, like your freedom, your privacy, and sometimes even your head. Wondery's new podcast, Even the Royals, pulls back the curtain on royal families, past and present, from all over the world, to show you the darker side of what it means to be royalty. From icons like Grace Kelly, Oscar-winning actress turned Princess of Monaco, who the world saw as the ultimate good girl. She mastered playing a happy wife and mother, but beneath it all, she was desperately lonely. Grace spent her whole life working towards perfection, and it ultimately cost her her happiness. Or King Ludwig II from Bavaria. He was only 18 when his father died, leaving the crown to him and a duty to rule that he never wanted. He refused to lead and used the funds from the royal treasury to further his extreme love of opera, but this choice eventually cost him the crown and his life. Follow Even the Royals on the Wondery app or wherever you get your podcasts. You can binge Even the Royals ad-free right now on Wondery Plus. Fargo, the new virtual assistant from Wells Fargo, makes banking faster and easier. Like this. Fargo, what's my checking account routing number? And this. Fargo, uh, turn off my debit card. And this. Fargo, what did I spend on groceries last month? And that's just the beginning. Do you, Fargo? You can in the Wells Fargo mobile app. Learn more at wellsfargo.com slash getfargo. Terms and conditions apply. Your mobile carrier's availability and message and data rates may apply. Wells Fargo Bank and a member of DIC. Meanwhile, Samuel Pepys had also woken up, saw the flames in the distance and thought, it's not that bad. It's just another fire in London. And then he fell back asleep. By morning, the fire had started to spread like, um, well, fire. Oh, that was such a bad joke. It was such a bad joke. But yeah, the fire had spread to the riverside. So down at the wharfs, 
that's where a lot of inflammable things were stored, including tallow, canvas, tar, pitch, fucking coal, just like all the stuff that burns really, really well. So the fire reaches there, and because it's full of, you know, the stuff we usually use to start and continue fires, well, fire's just, it just, it's a blaze. And so once that's up, people couldn't get to the Thames to, like, fill up their buckets because it's blocked by a fucking wall of fire. And then you've got this wind. So this wind is just picking up and you've got bits of just sparks and little bits of debris, burning debris, are just embers floating in the wind, carried by the breeze, dropping onto other wooden roofs, to thatched roofs, to, I don't know, just some tallow someone was using to make some soap. I don't know. It's fucking everywhere. And so the wind is spreading these embers all across. So these fires start appearing at different parts, like all around, so it's not in one singular location at this point, because the fire's been spreading. Now, because of this, because it was sort of going here and there because of the wind, some people thought that, you know, the city was being deliberately attacked, that this was arson. And you have to consider, at this point in time, like... England is at war, again, with Holland, with France. Like, there's there's fighting going on here. And people were just getting very paranoid. And they were believing that this was an attack, a deliberate attack, you know, on London to bring England to its knees. And so this made it very difficult for anyone who could be seen as an enemy of England and or English people. But before we get into that, back to Samuel Pepys who has been watching all of this from the All Hallows Church. He's up in the steeple watching London burning. And he decides he's got to do something. He's going to the king for help. So the king is staying in Westminster. And so he gets a boat there to tell King Charles II what's going on. And he, the king, is, you know, pretty worried about the entire city going up ablaze. And he sends Pepys back into London to force the Lord Mayor to start tearing down buildings and stop the fucking fire. So Pepys heads back into London, he gets to Bloodworth, he gets to the Mayor, and the Mayor's like, I'm tired. And he just buggers off. Like, he just, he just disappears, he's gone, and nobody sees him until after the fire's gone. Like, they just, he just buggers off. So while the fire is spreading, like they're trying to get these these fire engines in. I, I call them engines. They're kind of like fire carts and they've got like a wee pulley system. And they're so bulky that they can't really get through the narrow streets. And as they're trying to do that as well, you've got people panicking. And so you've got people blocking streets and trying to get through. And... It's just not doing much of anything. But they do start trying to pull the buildings down at this point. It is gain at Laldi. And it is going over London Bridge. Now at this point, London Bridge actually had houses on it. People lived on London Bridge. But luckily, or kind of unluckily, there had been a fire on London Bridge. I think either a year or a couple of years previously. And it burnt, like, one house. So one house was gone. So as the fire was spreading, the fact that this gap is there, it acts as a fire break. And so the fire doesn't cross the river. Which, lucky for some. Because, because, the last thing we want is for the fire to reach the Tower of London. Now, why may we not want, you know a massive fire to reach the Tower of London. That's because that's where all the artillery is held. So you have gunpowder and shit. And oh my god, sidebar, that is something I forgot to mention, is because of the civil war that had happened, you know, not that long ago, people still had, like, gunpowder stored in their houses. 
Not only were some houses, you know, just going on fire, but some of them were fucking exploding. Because people had black powder in their houses left over from deposing the previous king. Like, I just, I just, yeah. Yeah, so like, there's just, there's just burning. Burning, exploding, burning. And yeah, we don't, we don't want to reach the, you know, the artillery, the heavily stocked Tower of London, because that's, that's, that's really not good. We don't, we don't need cannonballs just like shooting across the city. We don't, we don't need that. No, 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 no. But yes, people are panicking and like, Somebody who's trying to get the heck out of Dodge, somebody who's trying to help, and somebody who's going to exploit the situation for gain. So there are some people like putting up inflating charges for carts and boats to get people like out of the city or to move their goods further away. Like Samuel Pepys ended up burying stuff in his garden. Like we all hear about the Parmesan cheese. He buried Parmesan cheese and a bunch of other valuables. Like I said, cheese was like a big deal. So a bunch of their expensive stuff was buried in their gardens to like protect it. And people would move like their belongings from like one building to like a friend or a relative just like further away from the fire. And some people would move things like even twice, three times a day because of how quickly the fire was spreading. And at one point, people start putting their goods into St. Paul's Cathedral because they're like, this is a big stone building, it'll be fine. Spoiler alert, it was not fine. And while King Charles II had given the order for the Lord Mayor to like start pulling down buildings, he decided he was going to be one of the people that was taking a boat and or cart out of the city. He just buggered off, like, bye. And throughout Sunday... King Charles is just offering help. He's offering royal lifeguards, soldiers, you know, just all this shit. But because he's technically not supposed to overrule the Lord Mayor, it, it's just it's just a whole lot of, you know, Tom fuckery. Because King Charles I, you know, drunk with power, and they don't want this happening again, so they're trying to, like, reduce him down. But it gets to the point that on the Sunday, like... King Charles II ends up travelling down on a barge, like, to inspect the scene. And he makes sure he's seen doing it, because, of course, it's a decent PR move. But it's a PR move, too. And he's like, shit, more stuff should be pulled down, because the Lord Mayor is supposedly pulling things down. And the last time Pepe saw him, he was just out of it, really. He wasn't coordinating things. He didn't really do well under pressure, really. And I do think sleep deprivation was like a part of it, but also, you know, he he fucked up. He fucked up royally. Because if he just pulled down those first couple of buildings, probably could have contained this. But that's neither here nor there. Except it's very much there. By Sunday night, the fire is absolutely raging. So because of these jetted buildings, there's this kind of vacuum that's being created on the lower streets, which is then fueling the fire and pumping it through... And it's created this little fucking firestorm. And by Monday, most people who had been trying to put out the fire were just trying to get the heck out of Dodge. They are just taking what they can and they're getting out. They're just going. Taking everything they can with them and they're trying to get outside, you know, the city walls. They're trying to get to somewhere safe. So by Monday, this is actually where it starts going over London Bridge. I I skipped a bit. But yeah, so it starts going up that way. Doesn't make it across the river, thank Christ. And it's also heading towards the financial heart of the city. It's going up Lombard Street. You've got bankers' houses, which are just on fire. The Royal Exchange catches fire by the afternoon. So all of these, well, rich people, or at least wealthier people, are like rushing in to like collect all their gold coins because they don't want them to, you know, melt. So they're grabbing these, they're grabbing all their gold and they're just trying to save that. And it's on the Monday that King Charles II says, fuck this for a game of soldiers and sends the Duke of York, the future King James II, who's, ah, he's just, he's just an arsehole. 
Oh, they all are. Anyway, they all are, really. There's just so many of them. So you've got banks, shops, the marketplace, everything is just burning. And the Duke of York is there with his royal lifeguards and they just start pulling down buildings. They're trying to create fire breaks. And even King Charles II ends up coming out and he starts physically doing things himself. I mean, he is physically working at putting out fires and and moving shit. And he is seen doing it. Like, there's, there's a purpose to it. It's really good PR. It is... It is perfect little piece of propaganda. I mean, it doesn't last, but it's nice for when it does. And the Gazette manages to, like, publish, like, one more, like, paper, the London Gazette, before, like, the whole printing press just up in flames. I mean, you know, full of paper. What do we expect? But it's just gone. So, like, one of the reasons the Duke of York ends up being put in charge of, like, organizing like the firefighting efforts is because the majority of the people would get up and go had got up and gone because they were at war with Holland and France and so they were out like currently fighting and so King Charles he had tried to get like people to come in and come back but they just wouldn't make it on time like he'd sent for them but it just wasn't happening and so you've got the Duke of York, the Earl of Craven, and like other courtiers are like in charge of this shit because the people who are supposed to be doing it just aren't either aren't available or have just fucked off. So yeah, yeah, it's not great. So you've got the camps around the perimeter, you've got troops, you've got people trying to break down fires. But because of the way the fire was raging, and because of, you know, the aforementioned wars, order kind of just dissolved on the streets. So while the wealthy are trying to get all their shit out of London because they're trying to just move stuff, they just start paying, you know, able-bodied poor people to like move their stuff for them because they're like, hey, carry this and you'll make a shilling. Fucking yes, I'll take a shilling. Thank you very much. So they're doing that. So they're moving. There's a lot of movement and at the gates, things are starting to bottleneck up a wee bit. Because, you know, people are trying to get out of the city and tensions are rising. So, because of the firestorm, like I mentioned previously, and because of the way that the, you know, the embers were flying around the city, as people started to get, like, full conspiracy theorists, they were convinced that this was a coordinated attack and that they were being firebombed. And so, it was assumed that, well, It was going to be a foreigner. So if you were like French or Dutch or had any kind of fucking accent at all, things were not great for you. On top of that, if you were Jewish, because historically, not the most well-liked of people for whatever fucking reason, for, I don't know, existing. I don't... What? Anyway, not the point. But also Catholics, because this was not an era of religious freedom and it's also another reason why king charles ii wasn't like super popular with you know the ruling elite and that's because he was kind of lackadaisical when it came to like religion he's like i believe what you want whatever it's not a big deal he wasn't you know out persecuting people for religion he wasn't that fussed about it like it it's fine you know believe in who you want to believe in just don't fuck with me seems fair enough to be honest So yeah, it was like, people believed it was a Catholic plot. This was, you know, like a firebomb attack by the armies. It was just terrorism. Like, they're just convinced of it. So instead of, you know, putting fires out and things like that, mobs and even some of the trips were just rounding up and like beating and attacking and just going after anyone with an accent, anyone different, anyone of a known, like, alternative creed. They were just going after them. Because the human condition, people just love to find someone to blame. Like, never mind the actual fire that is enraging around the city, that is just disintegrating as it goes. 
But there's this very real threat and danger to anyone of foreign birth, of an accent, of anything like that. And it's so bad that the Spanish ambassador, because he's rich as fuck and has security, opens up his fucking home in one of like the safe areas and he just starts bringing people in to protect them. Like m- most people did not have the opportunity and weren't as lucky, but he was just like, get in here. Like, fucking awful. Meanwhile, the fire rages on and London burns for four days. Like, London is just burning and burning. Some people were literally scorched from just embers in the air. Their skins burned by, it's actually described as a shower of fire drops. And then, of course, there's the animals. There were, like, pigeons with, like, singed wings and cats whose fur had all been burnt off. At this point, it's like nothing in London is safe. And then on Tuesday, ah, on Tuesday. Remember how I said earlier that a bunch of people had stored a fuck ton of stuff inside St. Paul's Cathedral, thinking it was going to be safe? Yeah, about that. Um, it explodes. Like, it is so hot. that Like, it just sends stones flying in the air. There's an explosion. And also, in addition, furthermore, the roof of St. Paul's Cathedral was made of lead. So the fire is so hot that it starts melting the roof. So it is trickling down the sides of the building, onto the street and then burning the pavement, and it's fucking glowing, like, the streets are glowing. Because you have to remember as well, like, at, like, the peak of this fire, it is 1700 degrees Celsius, about, um, 3900 Fahrenheit, like, it's hotter than lava, like, volcanic lava, it is hotter than that, that is how fucking hot London got which just seems like an average summer to be honest but anyway so you've got this fire that is hotter than you know lava and it is 91 meters tall now when you consider that St Paul's Cathedral is 111 meters tall like there's a 20 meter difference and this is you know fucking volcano fire which has by Tuesday, just consumed St. Paul's Cathedral. And then evening comes around and things start looking up because the wind is finally dying down. Like, it's finally calming down. However, because it's not pushing the fire east, it means the fire has an opportunity to go west towards the Tower of London. Because remember, we don't want the fire to go to the place with 272 kg of gunpowder. Luckily, the people fighting the fire actually clock this. Actually using their brains and, of course, their bodies, they managed to make a fire break, you know, in time, thus protecting the Tower of London and stopping from a bunch of stuff exploding, which is, which is nice. Because London exploding, not fun. Not fun at all. Then the wind picks up again, pushing the fire down towards the Thames. Luckily enough, where there's nothing left to burn. Like, it's all ash at this point anyway. And by Wednesday night, the fire is finally, like, it's under control. You've got the Duke of York's guards as troops. They're just managing it. And by Thursday morning, the Great Fire of London was finally over. But that isn't really the end of the story. So because it had been so fucking hot, you know, because of the 1700 degree fire, the ground was so hot, like for a lot of it, you just couldn't walk in it, like for days after the fire had gone, because that residual heat had, you know, stayed there. So quite a lot of London was, you know, ash at this point, just cinders and debris. So St. Paul's Cathedral, just gone 
the Royal Exchange, the Guild Hall, the Customs House, um, 87 churches, 52 company halls, and 65,000 homes. 65,000. And a lot of people had been living outside the city. They were staying in refugee camps and fields just to be, you know, safe away from the fire. And when the city cooled down and they could finally return, well, to where their home was, for at least 65,000 people, more, obviously, because families and stuff, but for at least 65,000 people, they had no homes left. And that's not including, like, people who also lived in, like, their business and things like that. So this is... It's all fucked up, really. And on top of that, there's this death toll. Now, there's only between, like, six and eight, like, recorded deaths, depending on how you take it. But because of the chaos of the fire and because, you know, the intensity of it, it would be very easy for human remains to just be incinerated, you know. So if you compare this fire to, you know, other like fires with similar populations, the death toll is usually about five to six hundred. So it's more likely to that, you know, five to six hundred people lost their lives in the Great Fire of London than, you know, the six to eight people that's like recorded. Because it just doesn't add up. Like, it doesn't add up, you know? And then, of course, there's wanting someone to blame. It's it's just a natural human thing. You want a reason for the situation. You want a reason for the occurrence. Because humans don't like happenstance. They don't like chance. Unless it's in their favour. Like, they don't like just tragedy existing. They want a reason for it. It's like there's always someone to blame. So some people thought this was an act of God, you know, and that this was punishment for, uh, I don't know, like anything from like the Merry Monarchs, like ways to Puritans' extreme beliefs to general personal failings you know in within your belief system especially when this is coupled with the plague you know they just felt like they're being punished for something and there's there's this rumor that you know the great fire stopped the plague it didn't it didn't stop it it was still there the plague still exists today so it it didn't get rid of it not by any stretch not even in london it lasted for a good while after so some people are blaming, you know, God. Um, or that they were being smited by God. Others blamed, well, Catholics, foreigners, etc. And one man actually ended up being blamed for it. Because you have this paranoia and fear. And they want a scapegoat. You know, they want someone to blame. And so there's this, this man... Robert Hubert and he's he's French and he's referred to as a wretched soul like he ends up confessing but confessions in the 17th century tend to not have a lot of weight behind them but he gets the blame of starting this fire this French watchmaker he has a false confession it's definitely a false convention like even like the judge and the jury Like, they don't believe he did it because it's, they're just relying on his confession, but none of it, like, adds up. And Thomas Farriner, the baker, he's actually one of the people that signs, you know, like, his belief that Robert did it. Because, of course, he doesn't want to get the blame. He doesn't want to get the blame of starting the fire, even though it was definitely his fault. He didn't douse his fire. Like, it's his fault. And so, like... Robert Houston, he's executed. Like, he's referred to as a wretched soul. So I think he had some issues. Depression, maybe. Maybe something else. But he needed help not being fucking tortured, 
made to give a false confession and then executed, that just seems, if you don't mind me saying, just a wee bit harsh. The ashes of the city were still smouldering when a decision had to be made. Like, so much of it had been destroyed. So many buildings burnt down that you could see from one side of the city to the other. You could see clear across. And so there was only one thing left to do. Rebuild it. Which is what King Charles II proclaims on the 13th of September, 1766, that London has to be rebuilt. And initially there was plans for it to be done by, you know, the Royal Society and to like really like redesign it and really carefully create it. But they needed it built sooner rather than later. So they basically just set safety standards. So instead of basing it on this sort of old medieval, you know, building structure, like Wooden houses were replaced with brick, no more jetties. So basically, the top floor could not be bigger than the foundation. It had to have the same, like, square footage, the same size top and bottom. And so most houses were built to a standard size. You know, um, water pipes, sewers, like, they're all in place. So, you know, there's going to be higher levels of hygiene. Or at least a wee bit more. Just a wee bit. A wee bit more hygiene. A wee bit more. A bit more safety, just a tad. But the way that the, the streets basically stayed the same, like, geographically, so it was still the same design as the medieval city, but just built better. Built better. That is an academic term. <laughs> Not more structurally sound. No, no, built better. So after this, a couple laws come into place. The Rebuilding of London Act of 1666, which basically was like the rules and regulations and safety for like houses and whatnot. The Fire of London Disputes Act, which were these fire courts that were established to basically stop people fighting over property and being like, I owned this house. No, I owned this house. And to just try and like sort it out properly. And then the Act for the Prefer. Nope, blah. The Act of the Prevention and Suspression. God damn it. The 1667 Act for the Prevention and Suppression of Fire within the City of London and the Liberties thereof. Basically, this made that all neighbourhoods, they would have, like, firefighting equipment. They would have axes, shovels, um, more access to water. And then, after this, it also leads people to set up fire insurance. And then all of these other companies start setting up fire insurance and it's it's all a bit wild. Now, some people just left London after the fire. They were like, I'm fucking done. Bye. Others, you know, tried to rebuild their lives. There were really fun set up for people to kind of try and do that. And then you've got people like the editor of the London Gazette who stopped, you know, being an editor he wasn't really doing his job and they would find him wandering around churches muttering to himself. And Samuel Pepys, who is one of the reasons why we know so much about the Great Fire, is that he would have nightmares of like more fires. More fires were coming. These people clearly had PTSD and these are the ones we know about because these are the ones that were written down. So of these two people who had relative stability and funds and security for their own mental well-being, if they are having PTSD and they are struggling, imagine what it was like for the lower classes, for minorities and those without privilege. Like, it's just all of this trauma that a lot of people wouldn't have had a way to deal with. You know? And so that is the end of our tale of the Great Fire of London. Don't forget if you liked my retelling of this piece of history, this event that once happened many moons ago, feel free to rate and review five stars on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever rating system occurs in your whole whole fandango there. 
Um, don't forget there are still spots available as well on my Trover trip, the Secret History of Scotland tour. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, like I have found the coolest. Um, it's this this escape room, but it also has this spooky bar. It's awesome. It's historical. It's just ooh, it's a bit dark, but I think you're gonna love it. So the first five, like fully registered people they're going to be going I'm going to be taking them there and we're going to win this escape room we're going to kick ass because that's what we do and don't forget you can follow me on all the socials I generally respond to Instagram Instagram's easier to message me on so if you want to follow me on Instagram who did what now pod I will probably say something back to you unless you say something rude to me or just send me memes don't fucking send me memes like there are three people in my life that are allowed to send me memes. And unless you already know that you're one of those people, then you are not one of those people. <laughs> I just don't send me videos out of context. I will not watch them. I just won't. Like, I don't know why. Maybe it's the neurodivergency in me. I, it could be. I am also on X, formerly known as Twitter, I guess. And a bunch of others. I'm on Facebook. There's other stuff. I'm around. I'm on TikTok, I'm on places. So, uh, yeah, follow, interact. Um, vote for me in the Irish Podcast Awards just to screw with them. <laughs> it's elitist, but it's fine. But yeah, and I guess it's recommendation time. So, for reading, I am going to suggest Bad Bridget. It's all about sort of Irish immigrants and Irish Americans. It's, it's really interesting. You should give it a go. Uh, for watching, I'm going with Only Murders in the Building because I love a weird, cosy mystery. And for listening, uh, I think everybody should listen to Busted's uh, Greatest Hits album. Like, all of the feminism just leaves my body when I listen to a Busted album. But there's this great version of She Wants To Be Me, which is just a fun, silly song. And it's got Bowling For Soup on it. Like, they're doing it with Bowling For Soup. And it's just, it's so good. It's so good. It just fills me with weird emo joy. <laughs> but with that, I'm going to bid you good night. So, adios, au revoir, au revoir, my friends. Bye-bye. Uh,